thank you for joining us for today's conversation on democracy and public leadership in the time of COVID-19. My name is Anat Admati, and I'm a professor of finance and economics and a direct faculty director of the Corporations and Society Initiative, CASI, at the GSB. CASI engages in dialogue, learning, and leadership in the intersection of markets, businesses, governments, and society to promote more accountable capitalism, governance, and trust. How do we ensure that corporations serve best and avoid harming customers, employees, investors, and the rest of society? And how do we ensure that we have the right laws and policies in place and hold government accountable? We're very honored to have as our guest today, Senator Sherrod Brown, the senior United States Senator from the state of Ohio and the ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee somebody who cares passionately about the issues that we at KSE focus on and care about. I first met Senator Brown almost a decade ago in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. In fact, both of KSE's faculty directors, myself and my colleague Paul Flatterer, testified about banking regulation before a subcommittee that Senator Brown chaired from 2011 to 2015. Our country once again faces a great many challenges, some similar to and some quite different from those of the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. I look forward to hearing Senator's perspective on how we got here and where we can go from here. Senator Brown has dedicated his career to restoring what he, in a reference to the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., calls the dignity of work. Let me give you a few examples of how he puts this mantra into practice. The senator often wears a pin of a canary in a cage as a symbol of the days when miners brought canaries with them into the coal mines before we had any rules protecting workers' health and safety. If the canary died, the miners knew that there were dangerous levels of toxic gas and it was time for them to get out. He says the canary is an important reminder of just how far the country has come from the days where workers could only depend on one another for protection, but also how much still needs to be done. Senator Brown also often notes that his zip code in Cleveland, 44105, had the most foreclosures of any of the nation leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. This fact symbolizes both the dire fate of homeowners who fell for predatory lending practices and the gradual hollowing of the manufacturing base in the cities of the industrial Midwest. It also encapsulates the connection between various aspects of economic policy from trade and labor to housing. At committee hearings, you can often find Senator Brown recommending that banking regulators read books like Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law. How forgotten history, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. And he once organized his fellow senators to boycott the Senate cafeteria until its workers received a raise. All of this is to say that despite being a member of an elite club that only admits 100 Americans, the senator maintained a level of empathy for and a connection to working people that is still all too rare in our most powerful leaders and institutions. We are again honored and grateful to host you, Senator Brown, today. To discuss the role of our federal government in this pandemic and related issues, Senator Brown will be joined by Susanna Shaddock, MBA 21, and one of the co-chairs of Cassie's event committee. After a conversation, they will open it up to some questions from all of you, which you can submit using the Q&A function. With that, I turn it over to Susanna and Senator Brown. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, Anat, and thank you so much for being here with us today, Senator Brown, and for giving all of us an excuse to put on some real clothes for a change. I haven't worn a suit jacket in several months now, so thank you. <laughs> I hope you and your family and your dogs are, are all well. Um, and I know we don't have a lot of time, so there's a lot to discuss. If you don't mind, I would love to just dive right in. For sure. Thank you. 
Okay, perfect. Well, we heard from um, Anat that you have been a longtime advocate for workers' rights. You've been vocal about the need to raise wages and benefits across America. And of course, in the context of this current pandemic, you've also been advocating for stronger protections for essential workers. I was particularly moved by statements that you made just one week ago in a hearing with Secretary Mnuchin and Federal Reserve Chair Powell expressing outrage that the Senate is still in session, um, putting workers at risk on Capitol Hill. So I'd love to start the discussion by just hearing from you what you think the long-term impacts of this pandemic will be on labor rights and policy in the United States. Uh, thank you, Susanna. And um, thank you, uh, Dr. Armadi, for your work. And um, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned the book that I recommend, uh, The Color of Law. I also recommend two other books that people should read to understand better um, our society and the, the, the mistreatment of so many and the good fortune of the most privileged. And I also mentioned in the book, uh, a, a, a book called Evicted and also a book called The Banker's New Clothes, which happened to be written by a, a notable Stanford professor. Those three books together tell you a lot about 21st century America. I also want to do a call out before I answer your question. I won't filibuster everyone, Susanna. Mm -hmm. um, to Graham, Graham Steele, who is one of the best public servants I know. Graham worked with me in my office, then worked in the Senate Banking Committee. Graham was the one that um, the, the senator always gets the credit. The staff person usually is the intellectual driving force. Uh, and also does so much else in terms of an inside outside strategy. But, but Graham back after the financial crisis, he'd been in our office not that long then, uh, he and I advanced the idea that members of the Senate and House should not be allowed to own corporate stock, that any, any ownership of any corporate stock is always a conflict of interest when you consider the panoply of things that we vote on in the Senate. Um, that amendment um, was defeated about two to one it has now come back as one senator, the chairman of the Senate, um, former chairman, he resigned over this, his chairmanship of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Republican of North Carolina, um, used, uh, is, is, is believed to, is alleged to have used information that we all got about the coronavirus early information. He got it even earlier because of his intelligence briefings. Um, we all had those briefings sometime later, but he may have bought and sold stock based on those, and I both so based on those screw those in those briefings. And to me, it's just I mean, it's incredulous that Senator that that the people that have the trust that we are the 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 responsibility we're entrusted with that 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 would be a step that you would take. So I, I'm not saying he's guilty. I don't know, but I know the temptations there for far too many of my colleagues, and and we are we don't. We're not giving up on Graham's idea and my idea from a, from an almost a decade ago on that. Um, how how things look different for workers? I I think uh, you know, someone I I do conference calls all day as so much so many of the privileged people as you will as, as as you might say those of us who are lucky enough to stay home, work safely and get paid as opposed to the million workers in Ohio and um, the, the three million I suppose maybe even more in California. Um, that are unemployed, and then the millions of workers that go to work every day um, in generally moderate and low-wage jobs, putting themselves at risk to the public, from the public and from co-workers, because they're not protected well enough, and, um, and, and then go home with the anxiety of, am I infecting my family? Uh, we call those people essential workers. One grocery store worker said to me uh, from Cincinnati, she said, you know, they call me essential, but basically I'm expendable. They don't pay me much and they don't protect me at work. And so these are 12, 14, 15, $16 an hour workers that drive buses and clean, uh, clean hospital rooms and, and do security and, 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 and um, do all kinds of stock shelves and grocery stores, do the checkout at drug stores. Uh, they're, pay, they're paid so little, we call them essential. And I think that's that in a nutshell is, is who we are and what we are as a nation far too often. Uh, the other story I'll mention, and then I'll, I'll try to get to the uh, sort of a, a broader view of, of where we are, is that, um, that when, you, when you look at this pandemic, you see the, 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 great, uh, the great revealer. It showed us, it shows us our, shows our faults. It shows uh, racial disparities. You, you know who's dying from this. You know who's going to work. I mean, the, the people that are working are, 
um, in the 12, 14, 15 dollar an hour jobs that are that are not protected and that are not paid well, the hourly workers are more more women than men, more likely to be people of color. Uh, they are the ones most disadvantaged by this economy this way. We know that. Look at the president's actions when, when um, hundreds of workers, many of them immigrants, not entirely, uh, many of them people of color, not entirely, but um, when it's slaughterhouses, uh, when there was the big outbreak in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, hundreds of people were diagnosed as, as coronavirus, with coronavirus. And after a couple of weeks, the president, using the Defense Production Act, something we had tried to get him to use to scale up testing and contact tracing and to scale up um, production of, of protective equipment. He used it to reopen that plan. He said, you're going back to work. The president said nothing about protecting workers, nothing about protective equipment for the workers, nothing about food safety, uh, nothing about slowing down the line. And if you know anything about manufacturing, um, you know that a faster, a faster assembly line means more workplace illness and workplace injury and sometimes even workplace deaths. So understand that's where we are as a nation. So what, what happens in the future is what we make happen in the future. We can go back to now that the whole country recognizes these racial disparities. Stanford students probably recognize them, those that aren't there just to go to graduate school and make more money, but those that are there like you are, Susanna, to want to make social change. Um, recognize this. Now the whole, no excuses for the country not recognizing these racial disparities. And the disparities are our income, health. We know that infant mortality, maternal mortality rates, uh, uh, the number of people dying in this from this virus, uh, housing from slavery to Jim Crow to redlining to the Trump administration trying to lock in by regulation many of the discriminatory practices that, that, um, that, 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 that occur in housing, all of those things. So it's really what we make of it. Are we going to use this newfound information? Are we going to do what we did at 10 years ago and just no, no, bank, no bankers went to prison, uh, no bankers, um, bankers didn't pay much of a price and homeowners, as Anat said, the homeowners in my um, zip code that were, so many were foreclosed on paid the price. Yeah, just speaking about 10 years ago, what do you think we failed to learn during that crisis in 2008 um, that you hope that we can learn and particularly act on today? Well, I don't, I don't know that we failed to learn. I think the, the people that, um, well, I'll illustrate this way, when the first, the first big recovery act, the first big stimulus package introduced in the Senate essentially by the president and the secretary of the treasury and Mitch McConnell, it was the same, it's this, it was the same kind of corporate bailout. It was good for the airlines. It was good for Wall Street. It was good for bankers generally, particularly the large banks, not so much community banks and credit unions. Um, and it did, it did pennies on the dollars for hospital, on the dollar for hospitals. It did nothing for state and local government, did a little bit to keep people from being evicted, maybe a little bit, and being foreclosed on. Did nothing for local, for state and local government. Didn't do any real money to help homeowners or, or people about to be evicted. If it was 25% of renters in this country pay more than half their rent um, in, uh, pay more than half their income in rent. So one thing goes wrong in their life and, and they're in the streets. So I, I don't know that we didn't know that 10 years ago. I do know we had a new president who, who was under the gun to get the economy back, back on, it, on its feet. Uh, one of the things that we tried to, we didn't, we, uh, when Obama took office, we were losing 700,000 jobs a month. Uh, and then as we began to do what we should have done, not in the quantity we should have done it, the Tea Party formed this basically phony AstroTurf grassroots group <laughs> that wasn't really grassroots. It was funded by the Koch brothers and by wealthy people to push back. So when, when we spend money on people, um, that, the budget deficits are a terrible thing. When we spend money on tax cuts for the rich, you'll grow out of these budget deficits. I mean, that's, the, that's sort of the Wall Street Journal way mm -hmm. and the Republican Party way now. But what, what we learned is just that we can't do it the same way. We did, nobody went to prison. Uh, nobody, well, the, the banker's new clothes wasn't written yet, but it was soon to come. And that, 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 would, that helps if people start, if, if, if I'm chairman of this, if we win the Senate, I'll be chairman of the Banking and Housing Committee. 
um, the banker's new clothes should be should be required reading, as should the color of law and evicted be required reading for some of the banking committee members. Um, but uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll say it a different way. And um, the the committee uh, not referred to me as the ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee. The name of the committee is Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. It's just colloquially called the Banking Committee. Um, the committee does very little on housing. Uh, if I'm chairman of that committee, it's going to minimally be called the Banking and Housing Committee, if not just the Housing Committee. The banks take care of themselves and the banks, we have a financialized economy. Um, we should learn from what happened 10 years ago that that's the case. Um, but we, what, what we're doing differently this time from 10 years ago is we're putting real dollars into real people's pockets, the $1,200 check. $600 a month, $600 a week unemployment benefits, the largest Congress has ever done. Uh, putting, uh, the, then putting money into local, local and state governments. We didn't do that in 2009. I think if we had, um, it would have, it, it might have had a different political outcome. It might have launched our economy, not just 10 years of growth as we had, but 10 years perhaps of wage growth. We had growth for 10 years. The economy that Donald Trump says was the best economy in the history of the world since like, I don't know, since Maimonides or something. But the, the fact is that, that it, it wasn't a good economy for so, so many people who saw mm -hmm. wage stagnation. So, so our focus has to be on wages, it has to be on workers, it has to be putting money in people's pockets. Uh, and then you go from there. So let, let's talk a little bit about the CARES Act in, in the context of those statements. Um, you recently shared a plan with Senator Warren for addressing this concern of, of getting relief directly to consumers and workers who need it most. Can you talk a little bit about what provisions and protections you think are most important for ensuring that this stimulus funding gets to Main Street and not just Wall Street? Well, we, we, know, that, um, we know that companies try to garnish their wages. Uh, it, when, when we, we know that whenever there is a big transfer of money, as there is, has been in the last several weeks from the federal government to individuals, the $1,200 per person plus five per, per adult, uh, again, there's, a, there's an income le limit, but for the great majority of the public, as it should be, um, $1,200 plus 500 per child, so some families will get a check of $3,400, two parents, two kids, um, or, or more or less. Um, we know that that you know that that calls out the vultures. That that gets the payday lenders excited. It gets the check cashing people excited. It gets the people that are going to. Those are just the legal ones. It gets people that are going to prey on. Just like you go to if you go to a military base, you can that can be in California, it can be in Ohio, it can be anywhere. You will see all these financial vultures, for want of a better term, all these companies right outside the base, ready to pounce on vulnerable military people. The wife goes overseas, stationed overseas. The husband stays at the base uh, with two kids and struggling. They don't have a lot of money. They're, they're lonely. They're all that. And the, 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 you know, the financial predators, and that's why the Consumer Protection Bureau is so important. The financial predators perch on, their, perch on the edge of their chairs, ready to swoop down. So um, we, 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 you know, so Senator Warren and I are working on legislation to, to protect those workers, to protect those the people there. Um, but we also have got to do many other things as the CARES Act started to do, not enough that we can talk about later if you want to, to put, to put dollars in people's pockets. Um, so when they are ready to, so they, they're, so they won't be foreclosed on so they can take care of their kids. I mean, hunger, hunger is a significant problem in this country now because so many people don't have the wherewithal to be able to feed themselves because of this pandemic. I mean, there's just so much we need to do. Uh, yes, there certainly is so much that we need to do. I I'm curious, um, you know, what are your biggest priorities for securing some of these protections as we think about what the next stimulus bill is going to look like? And in sort of the, the very near term, um, what do you think are the biggest opportunities for the government to act, you know, within the next few months to solve some of these problems? Well, one, one is that nobody's credit rating should, should be dinged during mm -hmm. this period, that uh, you know, you, lo you lose your job and then you miss a rent payment. It's, we're coming up on the first of the month again. The first of, of April, we saw a number of people who couldn't pay the rent then the first of May, now coming up on the first of June. Um, you miss a rent payment, you miss a mortgage payment, you shouldn't, after you lose your job, you shouldn't get your credit dinged. Uh, we thought we had that in the last stimulus and one very powerful conservative Republican 
um, in the state next to mine. I don't mean Mitch McConnell, although that's the state next to mine, but McConnell signed off on it, um, stopped it. And so we want to build in consumer protections like that. We also want to, we, we also, you know, we're, 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 a, we're a rich country still. Uh, we'll be a, be a very rich country in the future. Um, we don't, we, we, we need a tax system that works for working families better. And one of the things that we hope we can do in this, in this legislation is to expand the earned income tax credit again, something Speaker Pelosi and I worked on. We were the major sponsors four years ago to expand it five years ago. And we also need to do refundable tax credits uh, for right now, if you're, if you're making $80,000, you get a better, you get a bigger tax credit for your children than if you make twenty thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars so we want it to be fully refundable so so the poorest families in the country have money in their pockets and part of it is i i I've noticed this over the years that that um while republicans while conservatives the conservatives representing their interest groups love to talk about local control they they fundamentally don't really trust people and trust local governments to do the right thing that's why senator mcconnell doesn't want to send money to local governments um, who have had, whose, whose budgets have just cratered because of lost tax revenue. He doesn't want to send them money, but if he's forced to do it, he wants to attach strings to it on how they spend it. Uh, the same with poor people. He doesn't really want money to go to low income people, but if it does, if it does, he wants it, he wants work requirements. He wants it to be only spent on this or on that. He wants to tell them you can't do this, you can't do that. I, I trust both local governments and individuals um, if we really believe in the human spirit and believe in freedom, you, you help them financially and you allow them to make the decisions, what's best for your community, what's best with your family, for your family. That's why the child tax credit is so important. We're saying, yeah, you're a low income person. If you get an extra $3,000, we trust you to spend it on your, you're going to spend it right. You're going to spend it to do, to do the best thing to give your children a better future, whether it's clothes, whether it's food, whether it's maybe upgrading to a little better part. Well, maybe it's a, it's a better used car, so your car doesn't break down when you go to work and you miss work too many days. It's, it's all those things, but those choices, I mean, I know that, that Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump don't trust poor people to do much of anything, right? But frankly, you need to because they just might surprise McConnell and Trump by doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's um, sort of a, a related question that just came in from the audience that uh, is a perfect segue also into another topic that I'd like to discuss with you, which is, um, can we expand benefits like better health care to essential workers? And, and what are your thoughts on sort of the way that healthcare is structured in the United States and the opportunity that we might have now with this pandemic to change that? Um. Yeah, let, 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 let ask the first part of the question again. I, I, I didn't hear you quite. The first part of the question was just, um, can we expand benefits like better health care to essential workers? Or another thing that's come up is just separating health care from employment altogether. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, one, of, one of the things that I've advocated, in fact, I was on a, on a stage with um, Senator Kennedy in the late 90s. We announced, uh, I was a member of the House then with Senator Kennedy, Senator Moynihan, President Clinton, uh, I think Vice President Gore was there and, and a congressman from Northern California, Pete Stark, who has since passed away, was there. And we unveiled the first Medicare at 55 bill that, that people would have the option to buy into Medicare, they're 55. And you think about, I mean, I, I met a woman once who told me that, that she, um, she, she stood up at a town hall in Youngstown, Ohio, and she said, uh, she said, I, um, I'm 63 years old, my goal in life, she said, this is my goal in life, is to live two more years so I can get on Medicare. Not my goal in life is to get to go to London or my goal in life is to help raise my grandchildren. My goal in life is to live another year and a half so I can finally get insurance. She wow. had been working two jobs at low wages. And so the Medicare at 55 says that, that I mean, the, the, she, would have, she would have been helped by the Affordable Care Act for sure. I mean, she, mm -hmm. was, she was the person we were thinking about essentially. In that, but but we should people that are 58 years old, 60 years old, often when they lose their jobs, they have so few options. They have few options going back into the workplace, and they have few options on health care. And that's that's the group of people we both, both most want to focus on. So allowing Medicare buy-in at a reasonable price at 55. We actually had that in the Affordable Care Act, 
and one, sen one Democratic senator named Joe Lieberman um, essentially said, I'm not voting for it, and we needed 60 votes, and we lost it. And that, that would have changed everything. It would have meant a whole lot of people got insurance, and it would have meant um, the political opposition to the Affordable Care Act would have just been, um, just been cut off at the knees, frankly. Um, in terms of, of health care for people who have, who, from the pandemic, for essential workers, uh, I think one of the most important things we do is our pandemic pay proposal. Those workers, we are talking about earlier, grocery store worker, bus driver, uh, uh, person that does the, the, the changes the linen at the hotel, may make $12, $15 an hour and have those fears of the coronavirus and the anxiety when they go home. At minimum, if they're essential, we should pay them more. So we have in our legislation that the House passed that we hope the Senate we can sell much of the, these ideas, many of these ideas to the Senate, um, has something called pandemic pay or a hero's bonus that those workers will get $13 an hour additional pay up to $10,000 for the year. And it's something that if, if, if we're gonna call them essential, then we ought to treat them like they're essential. And I'm hopeful if we do that, it also can embarrass some corporations to actually pay these workers more too. And if we're gonna continue to say essential workers are only worth $12 or $15 an hour. Um, and I know that $12 and $15 an hour is even less where you live than where I live, but it's not a whole lot to live on in Cleveland either, yeah. um, let alone rural Ohio. Then, um, then we've got to actually act like we mean it. And a few, a few companies have paid, um, are giving pandemic pay bonuses, hazard pay, call it whatever, but they're short-lived and they're too minimal and we all need to do better. Yeah, so on that, on that subject of doing better, um, you know, a topic that comes up all the time here at the Stanford Graduate School of Business is the business roundtable's stated commitment to stakeholder capitalism. Um, you know, and we see that now Jamie Dimon is calling for a more inclusive economy in response to COVID-19. It appears that we might be in a moment to galvanize business leaders to move in a different direction, but, you know, not showing my own handle too much. I'm trying to be an unbiased interviewer here. I think at the same time, many are saying that these statements have been sort of revealed hollow by all of the actions that you just described. So I'm curious on your thoughts on this, you know, what can and should businesses do to really put their money where their mouth is when it comes to stakeholder capitalism? And how can we turn this into a moment of change in the corporate community? Uh, the fact that um, you're talking about stakeholder capitalism is a good sign, of course. I, uh, when I was growing up in Mansfield, Ohio, a town, an industrial town in those days, about 50,000 people, um, the, the local plant manager, there's a GM plant, there were all kinds of storied, iconic American corporate names um, had plants there. The, the plant manager maybe made 20 times what the average worker made. And the CEO of the company, either in Cleveland or in some city somewhere else, maybe made 40 times what the average worker made. Now the numbers, depending on how you calculate them, are a ratio of 10 times at 200, 300, 400 times what the average worker makes. Um, for, and for whatever reason, uh, the reason pretty obvious, self-interest, uh, the whole idea that, that, the, that the plant manager and the executives owed something to the community besides obeisance to their stockholders and uh, was really a, was sort of the way we did capitalism in those days. You owed something, your, your employees were important, your community was important, your customers were important, and maybe not the environment because I don't think they thought that much about that. Um, but they thought some, 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 some executives did. And today, um, blame it on Milton Friedman, but more blame it on just the, the, the greed of the greed of of of, of untrammeled un, un, of um, unrestricted capitalism or um, unleashed capitalism where why should you think about anybody else and you don't have to and that's um, that's become the mantra for corporation after corporation I I'm encouraged when Jamie Dimon says that I've heard Jamie Dimon say many things I like um, but I haven't seen you know and Jamie Dimon to his credit was one of the first big big operations that did that raise their pay, including their, I believe, including their food service custodial and security staff to $15. Uh, keep in mind, lots of companies contract out. They'll say, we're pay, we pay, here's our average pay. But then they contract out food service custodial and security to some other company. And you ask them, well, how much are they paid? Well, 
I don't know. I, I just watched my, I, I don't know what they're paid. I contract with them. Well, you signed the contract with them. You can figure that out really easily. So um, it really is holding them. I mean, I'm glad they're saying that stakeholder capitalism, it would, it would change our country if they really believed in um, being environmentally responsible and responsible to workers and responsible to, um, to the communities. Uh, it doesn't slow down their lobby. Those comments don't slow down their lobbying efforts to, to get more. So we will see, mm-hmm. but I, I don't, I don't count on them to do it. I think you make them do it. Yeah, your point about contract workers makes me think about the gig economy and the myriad companies that have um, come from right here in our backyard to sort of promote this new mode of working as as a contract worker, a gig worker. Um, what are some of your sort of biggest concerns or, or ideas around how we can better protect workers who are part of these less formal parts of the economy with some of the less formal protections that you've been advocating for throughout your career? It's, it's, been, it's been a battle forever. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of companies that, especially in construction, but in, in many businesses that, that want their employees to work off the clock and they, they pay them cash to the 22 year old worker. Um, it sounds like an okay thing because I'm getting more money here. It's cash, but I'm not paying into unemployment. I'm not paying into, um, I'm not paying to getting in retirement. I'm not getting health care, but I'm 22. I'll live forever. I don't need it. I mean, that's, that's part of the way they've gotten away with it. Um, one of the things we did to fix that, it's a very much a temporary fix, but it's important because it really could be a template for the future. I, I think in January, we're going to have a new president. I think we're going to have a different Senate in January. And if we do, um, there are some really big things we need to be thinking about, especially on climate and especially on racial disparities and income, wealth, race, class disparities. Um, one of the ways we addressed that sort of, well, last, last month, two months ago, was on our unemployment compensation bill. Um, workers now who are laid off get $600 a week. Uh, that's in addition to the state. The problem is in the states, very few, relatively few workers are eligible for unemployment. Uh, this is maybe a bit too much of an economics history lesson, but, but Congress over the last hundred years has passed three major social insurance programs, Social Security in the 30s, Medicare in the 60s, and unemployment insurance. Medicare and Social Security are essentially run out of Washington. That's, it is a bit one size fits all mostly. You're eligible, you, you pay in a certain amount, you're eligible, you get this much out. That's why it's called social insurance. You pay in, you get out. Unemployment, on the other hand, was done um, was turned over to the states. So Alabama's pay, minimum payment, or maybe average payment, is like $250 a week. New Jersey's is three times that. Ohio's in the middle. So it's not just, but the payment has been, has been ratcheted down over the years. The length of number of weeks you can get unemployment has been shrunk, and the eligibility has been narrowed. So gig workers don't get unemployment insurance in most states, maybe any state. Uh, mm-hmm. Part-time workers don't get it. Self-employed barbershop or salon owners don't get it. When we did the $600 a week, we included all of them. So some, if you're in regular unemployment in the state of Ohio or California, you'll get that plus the 600. If you're in one of those other categories, you'll get just the 600. But 600 is, um, is you know, it comes up to, it's, 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 it's not a, um, it's $15 an hour, essentially. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's not nothing. It's, it's more generous than I believe in government's ever been on unemployment insurance. So I think we need to start thinking that way. What do we do to sort of upend the, the evolution or the devolution of these benefits? And we're doing this with unemployment. I don't know that we'll ever get 600 permanent, but I think we might get the broadening of eligibility more permanent. And that's a really good thing. In Ohio right now, prior to the pandemic, 25, only 25% of people who were unemployed were getting unemployment insurance. That's how narrow they've been. And we're not an outlier. We're about the average on that. And that's, um, that's not what FDR and people that pushed unemployment insurance 100 years ago really were, were thinking of. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I, I'm going to switch to some questions from the audience in, in just a little bit, but there's one more topic that I really want to cover with you before we go there, which uh, you already brought up, the 2020 presidential election. Uh, I'm curious how you think COVID-19 and its ripple effects stand to change 
dynamics in the general election in November. And very specifically, we're getting some questions from the audience around how we can bolster democratic institutions in this time when they're being constantly sort of challenged and undermined and we have lots of external challenges to democracy. Yeah, I, I think it changes things in unpredictable ways. I, I'm always a little annoyed at pundits on television or speaking to Stanford classes that that speak with some certainty about their prescience and, and predicting the future. That's not redundant, because I, I don't know. I, I think that this, I think it's increasingly likely that the, the presidential outcome is a, is a referendum on, on the president, on the president's handling of, of the virus. And let me give, let me give two real, good, real quick examples. We are 5% of the world's population, something you probably know. We account now for about 31% of coronavirus's deaths in the world. That doesn't tell you a lot, but an even more, I think, illuminating uh, example is that um, the last time I got on an airplane was mid-March. Uh, I flew out of Dulles Airport, flew home. Almost nobody had a mask on. Yeah. Within days, the governor of Ohio shut down the schools in Ohio, first state in the country to do that. We have a Republican governor who's handled this pretty well. He's saved lives. Uh, I would say the Republican president has clearly killed people because of his action and action. But I picked that date of mid-March. That point, Republic of South Korea had about 90 diagnosed cases of coronavirus. The United States had about 90 diagnosed cases of coronavirus. Uh, the Korean government had experience with SARS. They had, a, they had a good public health system. They don't have better scientists than we do. They don't have better doctors than we do. They had better leaders than we do, at least their top leader. And um, they went to work with very extensive testing, uh, contact tracing. 265 Koreans have died in this of this virus. As of today, 100,100 100, Americans have died. The unemployment rate in Korea is under three and a half percent. The unemployment in this country is, I don't think we really quite know yet, 15 percent and, and up. Um, that tells you a lot about Trump's lack of leadership. I mean, you, you can't really put that anywhere else. And I say that, my, my, um, one of the things I, I loved about Anat's introduction, and I don't usually inhale my introductions, but is she talked about the canary pin I wear. I, most of my colleagues wear a, I mean, I don't have worn a suit like you haven't in a while, Susanna, but most of my colleagues wear the, the expensive Senate pen, jewel, whatever it's made of, jewels or dime, whatever it is. And, 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 and I wear this canary pen because it, it means so much to me. And it symbolizes public health, essentially, that one of the best things about this country is we led the charge, we, we led the effort to eradicate smallpox, which killed literally hundreds of millions of people in the first half of the 20th century. We led the effort to eradicate, not quite done, but almost eradicate polio. Um, I'm old enough to remember kids I went to school with that were partially partially crippled by polio. Some, some died, but they died way before I would have gone to school with them. Um, the, uh, and and we, 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 eliminated, we eliminated diphtheria. We kept Ebola out of this country and out of the world's, um, the, the world's, um, uh, were able to keep, keep Ebola in check. And we had, and so, so we have the best public health system in the world. And it's the best thing, it's one of the best things about our country. In one of the great fields to go into, taking your MBA and applying it to public health, or then getting an MPH or whatever you're going to do with your multiple degrees from Yale to Stanford to wherever, Susanna. But um, I, I think about how we we had a we had created an office. President Obama hired an admiral that was that used to work for Bush. His job was to essentially to to help eradicate malaria around the world. About two million people a year die from malaria around the world. It's much better controlled than it used to be. Um, and then President Trump took this same admiral, Timothy Zemer, and installed him as a uh, running an office of 40 people um, who, public health experts, whose jobs called the Office of Global Health Security. And his job was to survey, think about this, to survey the whole world and look for illness outbreaks and you know, whether it's in France or whether it was Nigeria, whether it was New Zealand or whether it was uh, Cambodia, and look for potential health, health, health outbreaks, and then marshal the forces of the World Health Organization, the CDC in the United States, our public health service in France and Britain and the rich countries, and go into those countries and figure out how to eradicate that disease, or at least to contain it. So his job was to look for epidemics 
potential epidemics way before they could become pandemics, epidemic one country, pandemic the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. And he was fired. He was fired in the summer, in the spring of 2018. I sent a letter to Trump the next week and asking him why and asking him to reinstate it, still no answer. We also saw in the last 10 years extensive, um, not exactly cuts in public health, but, but flatline budgets, which in essence is a cut in public health. Mm -hmm. So we went from the world's best, most admired, most principled public health country, I'd say in the history of the world, to sort of back of the bus. Uh, and you know, look at the CDC now. What the hell is the CDC doing? They should be leading on this. I don't even, who's that at the CDC? I don't know. He should be known as, he should be more, he should be better known than Bill Gates, the head of the CDC, because of what Bill Gates is essentially doing part of his job. And it just breaks my heart because public health, it, it just shows so much the heart of our country and who we are, or at least who we were before Trump in this pandemic. Gosh, I, I could just talk to you about that all day. Fascinating topics, but I think our audience would be uh, remiss if I didn't ask some of their terrific questions coming through. So here's a great question from our audience. Can you talk about any companies or industries that are models for how you'd like to see the private sector engage with public institutions or great examples of responsible business leadership that you'd like to see Stanford Graduate School of Business students emulate as they lead their own organizations? I'm not sure I want to call out individual companies or names um, for reasons of I will leave some, I will include some and leave Fair. some and perhaps embarrass the ones I'd mentioned. Um, I, there, are, there are all kinds of companies that do the right thing. I mean, I, all kinds of companies going back to stakeholder versus shareholder that, that have realized there are, there, are, there are better things out there. I'll, I, will, I will do one name. Um, and this guy's a really good friend of mine. So it's, and a, and a political friend. And it's, so, and he has my politics and all that. He's in Ohio and his name's Joe Canfer. And he runs a company that, um, called Gojo Industries. He runs a company that makes Purell. Mm -hmm. And he is, um, he's devoted much of his life to public health and figuring out what to do. And he's a big thinker. And I know, I just know how he runs that company. He's also, his company has gotten obviously very famous because everybody knows what Purell is now and they may not have known a year or two or five ago. But um, I think there's plenty of companies to emulate. I think it's, it's, it serves your purposes as, as Stanford students to, to really study those really good cases and see where they take you. And, and, and so and, and to, to learn, I guess, how you can do the right thing. You can align with shareholders, not just stakeholders, not just shareholders and still run a really successful company uh, and really start starting from the top where you set, where you really set the stage and set the tone. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a wimpy answer, but it's the best thing you can do. Hey, we'll take what we could get. We'll, we'll all take right. all of your knowledge. Um, here's another question from the audience on trade, slightly different topic that we haven't covered yet. Uh, the question is, you've supported tariffs in the past, but have also been critical of President Trump's implementation what would your ideal tariff regime look like? Well, I, I, um, I think it's our, our trade policy has done immense damage to this country. I fought, I fought with every president since I've been in office. Clinton, uh, I was in office for one week with senior Bush, but there are two weeks or whatever it was. Clinton for eight years, Bush for eight years, uh, Obama for eight years, Trump for four years. I've disagreed with every president on trade um, because frankly, none of them, put workers first. Uh, we, we were successful. This is the, I voted against every trade agreement because I saw where they led us. It, it, what our trade policy has done, and this is uh, perhaps especially important for, for Stanford uh, business students, is what our trade policy has done is simply, is, it's essentially said, uh, shut down production. You sh because of our trade policy, you should adopt this business plan. Um, you should shut down production in Cleveland and you should move overseas I lay off workers, move overseas, exploit weak environmental laws, enjoy cheap labor, and then sell those products back in the United States. That's essentially what our trade policy has done. I blame it on government. I blame it on each of those presidents. I blame it on my colleagues in Congress. I blame it on the media who all, and I blame it on, frankly, schools like the Stanford Business School who all say that free trade is the greatest thing in the world. Well, free trade is all about business. It's never about workers. Mm -hmm. And um, so when, when you pass a trade agreement lobbied by these corporations 
And the result is, well, I've got to move overseas. I can't compete unless I shut down production here and move overseas and sell back in the United States. That's one reason we were ill prepared for this pandemic. Why? Because we, we didn't have enough, we didn't have enough companies in the U S that made masks. We had, we didn't have enough companies that made cotton swabs. We didn't have above enough companies to do all the kinds of things you need for to address pandemic. We do that for national defense. We figured out that you really don't want foreign countries making the, making your planes and tanks. We ought to figure out, you don't want foreign countries, particularly when it's going to be the lowest wage, most exploitive of workers, foreign country like China. You don't really want them making um, the equipment you need to, to, um, to combat a pandemic. So our trade policy is morally bankrupt. It, it has simply said it's all, about this, it's all about the shareholders. You couldn't have passed this trade, these trade agreements if it were about stakeholders because it hurts communities and workers. Last point I'll say is we had a first trade agreement I ever voted on was this four was last year. And it was the renegotiated NAFTA, and it adopted the language that Senator Wyden from Oregon and I wrote uh, with Nora in my office, who's a friend of Graham's. And this language said, essentially said that workers that that workers come first in these trade agreements. There need to be a, a real minimum wage for workers. There need to be um, uh, protections for workers, not a race to the bottom where workers are exploited in the in the in the environment is contaminated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I was actually just doing a, a reading last night for one of my classes that was talking about how free trade has essentially um, exported deflation from, from different countries and the buck is going to stop as the global economy is sort of coming up and, and we're running out of places to outsource this labor to. So I think your points are, are very well taken, particularly in the context of uh, a business school. Um, uh, here's another question that brings us back to the 2020 election. Um, can you talk about Ohio specifically and the country's efforts to ensure a safe, fair election in 2020? Yeah, I, I, I am convinced that that um, a majority of the country will vote against Donald Trump. I'm convinced of that. Um, I'm also convinced that that this president will try to cheat. It'll, it'll be the Russians. It will be voter suppression republicans have institutionalized voter suppression uh, they do it through redistricting through gerrymandering they do it through the court system always by a vote of five to four in this most partisan in history at least the most partisan in my my memory of history of uh, of supreme court we've ever seen that always come down on the powerful against for the powerful against workers come down against voting rights um against uh, on this on the opposite side of people of color, especially in poor people. Um, I think we win anyway, and I think we win because we out-organize them. Um, there are more of us than there are, than there are they, them, than there are they, I guess. Um, they are, they will, you know, we, 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 need, we need to shine a, shine a light on what they're doing in voter suppression. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody can vote by mail. We need three things in the election system. I used to run Ohio's election system. I was Secretary of State a good many years ago. You need three things. You need vote, vote, people can vote by mail. And voting by mail is safe. Trump is just a liar, again, about that. He just makes that up about, about voting by mail. Voting by mail is safe. Um, we should have um, the polls open. We should have early voting at least three weeks. Should be a month before the election where you go to your local, a local voting center, at least one in every county and big cities, there should be more. And then you have the poll, polls open on election day. Uh, and we do those things, we do those things, we win. And I think we're gonna win anyway, but I think that we're gonna win by a big enough margin and we shine the light on them and we still have a free press in this country that will shine the light on any kind of shenanigans and, and misbehavior by people that don't think that voting rights is sacred. Vote by mail uh, just triggered in me a, a thought of the, the US Postal Service, which has been in the headlines a bit recently. Um, and I understand from Graham actually is, is a bit of a sticky topic in Congress. Uh, what are your thoughts on sort of bailing out the Postal Service, the, the continued operation of the Postal Service? Yeah, the Postal Service has had financial problems for years, in part because Congress did something for the Postal Service or to the Postal Service it didn't do anywhere else in, 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 our, in our economy. And that is they, they forced the Postal Service to fund, to finance, fund 
its pension systems way more generously and way mm. more than they needed to out X number of years. Um, that put them in a financial bind to begin with uh, from out under from which they can't crawl or something. I remember trying to say that. Um, they, they also, uh, we know the competition obviously the Postal Service gets now from companies that um, from all kinds of uh, package delivers and mail delivers. Postal Service is a public utility though where they must they must deliver to the most remote place in North Dakota. They must deliver medicine to the, the smallest town in the biggest city, the most dangerous neighborhoods or whatever. So they, they do things that private, it's, it's typical of privatization. I mean, privatization always skims the most profitable routes, the most profitable businesses, the most profitable um, entities and leaves the government to do the rest. That's why um, privatization of prisons, privatization of social security, privatization of Medicare, um, all of those end up hurting the public and enriching the companies that privatize, but always undermine the service. And that's what's essentially happened with the post, the post office. And now with the pandemic, the post office is in big, big trouble. And uh, there is simply no reason. There are two, there are two reasons that Mitch McConnell doesn't want, to, um, doesn't, want to, doesn't want to put money in the postal service. Number one is he really does think a crippled postal service will make vote by mail even more treacherous and difficult. And the other thing is there are hundreds of thousands of postal workers, uh, letter carriers, rural letter carriers, postal workers that work in the mail sorters, there are several different, um, but hundreds of thousands of postal worker union employees. And, and Mitch McConnell doesn't, uh, one of his goals is to, is to attack the union movement and weaken the union movement because he knows they push back on, they push back on his interest groups, the NRA, um, the drug companies, Wall Street, the people to whom McConnell has sworn obeisance. Makes sense. Uh, wow, well, we're coming up on time. This, this hour flew by. Uh, Senator Brown, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to speak with us this afternoon and give you an opportunity to share any final thoughts for our audience before we leave. No, just, just thank you. I, um, I was going to say, I wasn't going to say this, but I am. I, I applied to Stanford a long time ago and got waiting listed and ended up at the school that Susanna went to. Um, but anyway, I, I got over it, um, sort of. <laughs> so, but it's an honor to speak to all of you. And I, I hope so much that you um, listen to the, some of the questions that were asked clearly from a viewpoint of, of pursuing a life, and a, 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 an occupational life, if you will, of justice. And there, there are so many things that that the privilege of going to Stanford, the privilege of going to Stanford Graduate School, um, not knowing what you what your backgrounds were, of course, to be able to get that privilege and earn that privilege for the great majority of you. Um, I hope you'll use that for public health that Susanna asked about and making this country a fairer, better place and help us eliminate racial disparities and class disparities, help us deal with the issues of climate and the great moral issues of our time. And you are some of the best situated young men and women in America to do that. So um, thanks for having me. And uh, thank you, especially in Graham and my friends at, at Stanford and Susanna, thank you. It's good being with you. Thank you so much. And clearly it was Stanford's loss that uh, we didn't get you, but um, <laughs> you know, thank you again for joining sure. us today in spite of all of that. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks everybody. Thank you.